Western Pacific and one of those four uh, Russian bomber aircraft actually flew twice over the deck of the USS Nimitz aircraft carrier which was sailing in the Western Pacific out of Japan. It flew 2,000 feet off the deck of the carrier. Uh, the Russian bombers were trailed by four F-18 fighters. No shots fired, no verbal communication even between the two sides, but something that the U.S. is not very happy about, obviously. Uh, the Russians for the last several months, as you know, have been stepping up their strategic bomber flights, their long-range patrols out of uh, the uh, Pacific area of, Russian, of Russia, flying into the Western Pacific, flying near the Alaskan coast. It's not the first time, but flying twice over the deck of a U.S. aircraft carrier is not something the Navy likes to see.
At no time did Russian planes enter Canadian airspace, but uh, within 24 hours of the President's visit here to Canada last week, uh, we did scramble two F-18 fighter planes uh, from NORAD and Canada Command. They, uh, they met uh, a Russian aircraft that was approaching Canadian airspace, and as they have done on previous occasions, they sent uh, very clear uh, signals that are understood that that aircraft was to turn around, uh, turn tail, and head back to its own airspace, which, uh, which it did. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, unusual, uh, because we have seen previous uh, uh, activities in the north, uh, but they have increased. It's difficult to say whether this was, uh, was a coincidence or it was an effort on the part of the Russians to, uh, to simply uh, perhaps be up to some mischief or cause a bit of a diversion. Um, clearly it's a coincidence uh, that it happened um, at a time when you know, our security focus would be Ottawa. I'm not going to stand here and accuse uh, the Russians of having deliberately done this during the presidential visit. Uh, but it was a strong coincidence uh, which we met with uh, uh, a presence, as we always do, of F-18 fighter planes and very cl world-class pilots uh, that know their business and send a strong signal that uh, they should back off and stay out of our airspace. Japanese defense officials say two Russian bombers took an unusual course circling around Japan. The Defense Ministry says two Tu-95 bombers from the Russian Air Force approached Japanese airspace near the Strait of Tsushima on Thursday morning. Fighter planes from Japan's Air Self-Defense Force scrambled to track the bombers. The aircraft later flew southward over the East China Sea and then south of Okinawa's main island. Afterwards, it moved to the Pacific side before skirting along the Japanese archipelago northward. The bombers continued flying over the Strait of Soya while being fueled midair. They then headed south on the Japan Sea side before leaving areas near Japan. The Defense Ministry says the bombers did not violate Japan's airspace, but it was an unusual route for any Russian military aircraft. The Russian Air Force has been active around Japan recently. Bombers and spy planes have approached Japanese airspace five times since last month. Several Japanese self-defense force fighter jets were scrambled early Wednesday after Russian military aircraft were spotted near Japan's airspace. The Russian aircraft remained in the area for 12 hours. Japan's defense ministry says two Russian Tu-95 bombers and an A-50 surveillance jet approached western Japan over the Sanin region on Wednesday morning. Japanese fighter jets immediately took off and tracked them. The ministry says the two bombers stayed near the Japanese archipelago for 12 hours, while the A-50 circled over waters of San In for nine hours. The A-50 is equipped with an early airborne warning and control system. At around midday, another two Su-24 surveillance planes approached Japanese airspace between Hokuriku and Hokkaido in northern Japan. They stayed over the Sea of Japan for several hours. None of the planes intruded into Japanese airspace, but the ministry says it's unusual for Russian military aircraft to fly in such numbers so close to the country. The ministry says it's the first time Russian planes equipped with early warning systems have been spotted near Japan. It says the Russian Air Force may have been conducting sophisticated surveillance drills. Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos said on Tuesday that his government would send a protest note to Russia over the alleged violation of Colombian airspace by long-range Russian bombers. Colombian officials say two Tupolev Tu-160 supersonic Russian bombers had crossed into its airspace on Friday whilst en route between Venezuela and Nicaragua as part of a military exercise. The Colombian president added that Colombian clear jet fighters had intercepted the Russian bombers as they re-entered Colombian airspace during their return to Venezuela. Russian defense officials reported last month that two of its supersonic bombers, which are capable of carrying nuclear missiles, would head to Venezuela as part of a joint military exercise. Colombia, a longtime U.S. ally in South America, has received around $6 billion in mostly military aid from Washington since 2000 and has access to several of the Andean country's military bases. 
Venezuela and Russia have forged deep military ties in recent years with the South American nation, having received billions of credits from Russia to purchase tanks, fighter jets and air defense systems. Russian bombers have arrived in Venezuela for training exercises. The aircraft were accompanied by NATO fighters on their way to the country, according to Russia's defense ministry. Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez says the arrival of the planes is not related to recent events in South Ossetia in any way. The bombers are due to conduct training flights in Venezuela and return to Russia afterwards. Chavez also said he would gladly pilot one of the aircraft. Russian strategic bombers, Tu-160s, have landed in Venezuela. Yes. Yes. Hey, glad you're up. Russia flexing its muscle now by sending a nuclear message to America. Got a spokeswoman for the Pacific Air Force in Hawaii confirmed that just days ago, two nuclear-armed bombers from Russia circled the U.S. territory of Guam before being intercepted by American military jets. Is this proof that Russia is uh, becoming a greater threat to the U.S. than the administration has led on, known all along but doesn't want to tell us? Bill Gertz, senior editor of the Washington Free Beacon, joins us live from Washington. Bill, what do you read into this? Well, Brian, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, when I asked the uh, Air Force spokeswoman why the Russians were doing this, she told me to ask the Russians, which is kind of a joke. Uh, I think this was clearly a simulated nuclear attack on the United States, and it's not the first time. This is actually the third incident where Russian strategic bombers have come close to U.S. coast. The last one in June was part of a major strategic exercise where a Russian general actually said they were practicing uh, targeting our missile defense bases in uh, Alaska and California. What's our response been? Uh, silence, pretty much. Uh, the administration is trying to salvage their reset policy, which has been a, pretty much of a disaster. It's been totally one way. The U.S. makes concessions, the Russians pocket them, and continue on a more aggressive and more anti-democratic posture. Now, uh, why do you think that is? I mean, it didn't seem that long ago where George Bush was riding around with Vladimir Putin, and they talked about a new era in U.S.-Russian uh, relations. What has gone wrong? What is their complaint with us? Well, the Russians under Putin uh, are trying to remove, move back into the Soviet period. They, they see that as the glory days, and they're, they're rebuilding their military. They're building up their nuclear forces in a major way. At the same time, uh, the U.S. is getting ready for further nuclear cuts. And that is happening right now. We want to cut our arsenal by another, uh, uh, by another third. There's been right. no response. Now Secretary of State Kerry picks up the phone to talk to his counterpart in Russia. No, re no return call until yesterday. Yes. And uh, one of the chief U.S. arms negotiators, Rose Gottmuller, was in Russia almost at the same time that this bomber incident occurred, and she didn't, never even raised this issue. She's uh, looking to try to get a new round of arms talks going. And Bill, politically, it seems as if everything is blamed internally on Russia. Everything that goes wrong, they bring it back to America. They're trying to create an anti-American feeling again inside Russia. Is it working? Uh, well, you know, I think the Russian people look, still look at the U.S. as a, a beacon of freedom and, and want that. Uh, of course, the Putin regime has kind of taken Russia in, back into the Soviet days, and I think he's kind of appealing to the hardliners in the Russian military who are in the midst of this uh, military buildup. Bill Gertz, Washington Beacon, thanks so much. Thank you. Rumor or not, it's creating a Cold War buzz. Russia says it will respond if the U.S. goes ahead with its missile defense plans in Europe. But media reports that it could land long-range bombers, nicknamed White Swans on Cuba, are being denied by government officials, both current and those who lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis. Cuba the question about Cuba has already emerged once in the history of Russian-American relations and nearly led the two nations to nuclear war. Izvestia newspaper quoted a high-placed source saying, while the Americans deploy anti-missile systems in Poland and the Czech Republic, our long-range strategic aircraft will be landing on Cuba. There's no strategic reason to land our bombers there. Our aircraft have great capabilities and some can fly for over 13,000 kilometers without refueling. Washington warned Russia would be crossing a red line if it were to base nuclear-capable bombers in Cuba. 
The White House itself refrained from commenting because there has been no official response from the Russian government. The U.S. has tried to reassure Russia their missile plans aren't aimed at them. And Russia has repeatedly asked, then why so close? We know they want to deploy on our borders, only a few dozen kilometers away. How will that protect the U.S. from Iran is difficult to say. If they really wanted protection from Iran, they would deploy close to their borders. Russia is waiting for the U.S. to clarify its position on the issue of missile defense. The foreign minister says Moscow has still not received concrete and clear-cut proposals. If the U.S. goes ahead with its plans and Russia responds by returning to Cuba, positions would strikingly resemble the 1962 missile crisis that brought Washington and Moscow to the brink of war, a situation both sides have sought to prevent over the last four decades. As we speak, of course, Senator, there is a Russian warship docked about 200 miles from Miami, Florida, at a port in Havana, the capital of Russia's old communist comrade Cuba. Reportedly, the ship is armed with giant 30-millimeter guns and anti-aircraft missiles. AFP first reported its presence, but there's been no official explanation for what this Russian ship is doing there. And, of course, in southern Ukraine today, dozens of armed men stormed regional government buildings, including the parliament there, and raised Russian flags. Ethnic Russians and a rejection of the power claimed by Ukraine's interim government are clashing with Ukrainians in the streets there. What do you think Putin is up to? I think he's up to trying to preserve his absolute commitment and ambition of uh, maintaining Ukraine as the part of the Russian Empire. You've got to under we don't seem to understand that Putin is a KGB colonel apparatchik who believes in the Russian Empire. That's why he invaded Georgia. That's why he put pressures on Moldova, the Baltic countries, and the crown jewel of that is Ukraine. I have said all along I don't believe he's going quietly and I don't believe he's going to invade. By the way, the warship in Cuba is sort of just a little saber rattling. But what's really uh, concerning now is particularly Crimea, but also eastern Ukraine. When, and Crimea is the naval base of Sevastopol, which he does not want to lose. And I believe that's what is happening now is they're creating unrest. He's not going to send troops in a la Hungary. He's going to, he's going to, his, his people and special forces are in there fomenting uh, unrest. And I think he would, he will take further steps in order to achieve a goal of at least a maintaining control of parts of eastern Ukraine and especially Crimea. And I, and I believe that he's intent on it. And we need to have a very strong statement about the unacceptability of such actions. Еще один, смотри. Чё ты очкую? Ах, 
принять. Киевским часом. Стали долбанные бандеровцы, блядь. Ну зря же они тут искупили. Ну я надеюсь, это российский. Chief National Security Correspondent Jim Shooter joins us with more on this. Jim, Jim, what happened here? So two, two Russian bombers, Tupolev 95s, when you look at the picture of them, it's, it's this Cold, Air, uh, Cold War era plane, you know, it's, it's a turbo, turboprop actually, first started flying in the 50s. Anyway, flew north over Scotland, got close, the British scramble jets, and then in succession, uh, the Dutch and the Danish as well to, to escort them out of European air, airspace. Um, and at the same time, uh, th there's also a Russian ship that approached uh, British waters and a uh, British Navy destroyer escorted that out of the way. And, and what the British are saying, and you'll, you'll talk to many, they say that this has happened before, no question, but in light of what's going on in Ukraine, they're much more attuned to Russian military activity. Sure, it's the context yeah. is disconcerting but, but when you say it's happened before how often does it happen it, it, the truth is it happens all the time it happens about half a dozen times a year that the british i think last year was eight or nine times the dutch have had it had it happen six times or so and oftentimes they'll even break into uh, european airspace for instance today uh, they got about a half mile into dutch airspace and it happens in the u.s as well off the coast of alaska you will have russian fighters and bombers come in kind of buzz the airspace and then you know as it, you know it's protocol the american jets scramble they go up and kind of politely escort them on their way. So, and, and why do they do it? I mean, partly it's, it's to test uh, the air defenses and to see how sharp, in effect, the Europeans and the Americans are. It's also a little bit of a reminder. It's a game of cat and mouse. It's like, we're here, you yeah. know we're here, and, and of course the Americans say, we know you're there. But now, I mean, the key now is do they see a step up in this kind of activity? So far this is routine, but they're going to be watching to see when it becomes no longer routine. Well, we know they're there. Yeah. <laughs> and then, <laughs> we don't need the reminder. But they, you know, exactly. Thank you so much. Supporters arrested on Friday when more than 40 people were killed. Ukraine's prime minister, who was visiting the city today, told Sky News his country was facing a well-planned and well-plotted Russian operation. Well, Sky's Katie Stallard is live for us in Odessa tonight. Katie. 
Yeah, Anna, there are still protesters outside that police station tonight. They are demanding their papers back. 67 protesters have so far been released. They were arrested after the violence here on Friday. But such is the level of trust in, this, in the police in this city now. They just don't believe them. So they want their papers back too. They want firm confirmation that the cases against them are being dropped. For the first time today, we heard chants of Odessa rise up. They were marching through the city centre in their hundreds, chanting, as I say, Odessa, rise up, and also expressing support for the separatists in the east of this country. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister, the acting Prime Minister, Yatsenyuk, was here. He told us that the world is now facing a new kind of war. The man charged with leading Ukraine out of this crisis arrived at Odessa's main hospital today. He told Sky News his country is now effectively at war with Russia. It seems to me that the entire world is facing a new type of war. This is the new war. With the military, with no insignia on their uniforms, with an agents that have well-organized terrorist plot network, with the political and diplomatic pressure on Ukraine, with the tough and rude Russian propaganda, with the playing on Ukrainian sentiments, and not only on Ukrainian, and with the real threat to the global security, and mainly to the European one. So you believe you are now effectively at war with Russia? This is the war, and we are the wartime cabinet. This is true. One of those seriously injured on Friday night was wheeled across the courtyard to meet him, past the prime ministerial motorcade. He agreed to speak to us from his hospital bed. Valentin told us he is an 18-year-old student from Odessa, that he went to take part in a peaceful protest for a united Ukraine when pro-Russian activists attacked them. When we arrived, there were people fighting. Separatists were shooting at us from behind the police lines. In the city centre, they were holding a memorial for the 42 who died here, singing hymns and holding religious icons. These people are predominantly pro-Russian, united against the government in Kiev, convinced that their language and their way of life are under attack from fascists and ultranationalists. The city had been peaceful so far, but now they're shouting their support for separatists in the east in Donbass. With the chanting, Donbass, we are together with you, and they are marching to the police headquarters where some of the pro-Russian protesters, the people they are saying are the heroes of this city, are being held. They killed our brothers in Odessa. They were burning them alive, and the police did nothing. Some of the protesters pulled down the national flag. Others insisted they put it back. They said they didn't want violence here. They forced open the gates at the side entrance to the police station. From inside, riot shields were passed out. They want those inside to be released. And then the first officer emerged half sheltered, half surrounded by the crowd. Another group emerged with shields up, attempting to retreat slowly down the street. Again, some of the protesters tried to protect them, but it is clear here who is in charge. The police were outnumbered and out of options. They left to applause from the crowd. The Prime Minister might be calling for peace and reconciliation, but they're not listening to him or his government here. I think it's important to say that what is happening here is quite localised. I mean, you see this happening in the city centre outside the police headquarters today, and there were a fair number of people involved in that. But elsewhere, this city is carrying on as normal. It is not that all of this city is rising up, that all of this city is taking part in this. There were also a fair proportion of the protesters who were on that march, who were trying to keep this peaceful, who were remonstrating with people who were pulling down flags, who were trying very much to police themselves, 
themselves who were also trying to protect the police as they retreated. But what was so striking was to see the police this evening retreating behind their riot shields, very much outnumbered, being directed by the crowd. And you get the real sense that they just do not have authority in the centre of this city at this time and that the people who are there do not trust the police. Long-range bombers are patrolling the skies on a regular basis once again. And the Tu-95 Bear remains the backbone of the country's strategic fleet. It's an aircraft that many consider to be a Cold War legend. Our correspondent, Mihail Lebedev, wants to take a closer look. It may be colossal, noisy and old, but it's still daunting. After almost 50 years of silence in the skies, Russia decided to resume regular long-range patrol flights. And these exotic-looking Tu-95 strategic bombers are back on Russian and NATO radar screens once again. This turboprop had its first flight more than a half a century ago, but it is still fundamental for Russia's strategic aviation. The main advantage of this plane is that it is very reliable and simple, so it is easy to maintain it. In the late 1940s, Joseph Stalin ordered the creation of a bomber that could fly to the United States and back, and they had to be capable of delivering deadly nukes. Several jet versions of the aircraft were presented, but all stopped short of the necessary requirements. Realizing that the jet engines at the time weren't durable enough to perform transatlantic flights, the designer Tupolev looked to the turboprop instead, and it proved to be the right decision as Tu-95 made its first public appearance in 1955. Now the engines that move the strategic bomber are one of the kind. It is the only airplane to use the coaxial system of the rotor engine, which pretty much allows it to go for very long distances. These turboprop engines also made it the noisiest military aircraft on Earth. Its size and the roar of the propellers earned it a NATO designation, the Bear. Its blades rotate faster than the speed of sound and the Bear holds the unofficial world speed record among propeller-powered aircraft, almost a thousand kilometers per hour. And experts believe it still has a bright future. It doesn't matter that the plane is old. The main thing is that the avionics and weapons systems are modern. For example, the Tu-95 can be used effectively as a cruise missile platform. It can fire missiles thousands of kilometers away from the target and return safely to base. Along with the speed, the aircraft has a good flying range as well. Those 10,000 kilometers that Stalin was looking for were exceeded by this model. All this made the Tu-95 suitable for a wide variety of missions. Maritime reconnaissance, jamming and intercepting radio signals are just a few examples. And in 1959, a civil version of the Bear Tu-114 flew the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev to New York in just 11 hours. The fuel tanks of this aircraft are situated right in the wings. Now the capacity of it is almost 100,000 liters, which would be enough for almost 30,000 kilometers. Later on, the flight range of the Tu-95 was increased through mid-air refueling. It means missions can last up to 20 hours non-stop. And this could be quite challenging for the crew, as the tiny cockpits don't even have room for a toilet. But with bears being upgraded through modern technology, it's likely that Russian pilots will have to sit tight in the near future. Mikhail Lebedev, Russia Today, Engels. So this morning, the world's most powerful non-nuclear bomb has been successfully detonated by Russia. The resulting mega blast was said to be as potent as an atomic explosion, but without the radioactive fallout. Dmitry Daniluk reports. No information of where this test took place, no sound of the explosion. You're watching the testing of what Russia says is the world's most powerful bomb. 
Tests show its effectiveness and capabilities are comparable to nuclear weapons. At the same time, use of this weapon doesn't damage or pollute the environment, like a nuclear weapon. The bomb explodes in mid-air, igniting a fuel-air mixture. The destruction is caused by extremely high temperatures and aftershocks, incinerating everything in sight. Afterwards, scorched earth looks more like the surface of the moon. But according to the military, there is no chemical or radioactive fallout. Russia's defense ministry says its development does not contradict any of its international arms agreements and insists that it is not a start of a new arms race. Up until now, the United States had the most powerful fuel air bomb in the world. Christened the mother of all bombs, it was tested in 2003 at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. The Russian military has dubbed its version the father of all bombs. Known as the vacuum bomb, it uses a fuel air explosive more powerful than TNT and can create shock waves equal to an atomic bomb. It allows us to reduce accuracy requirements, which makes it cheaper, but it's still a quality modern weapon. Russia says its bomb is smaller and lighter, yet four times more powerful than the U.S. version and destroys a larger area. U.S. experts say the development of such a weapon could be very significant. In both cases, these are fuel air explosives uh, designed to generate intense blast pressure over a large area. Uh, it's reported that the Russian bomb is a so-called thermobaric bomb that produces both blast and heat. Uh, the Russian military has been a pioneer in the development and use of these thermobaric weapons. Uh, this would have to be one of the largest deliverable, uh, droppable uh, uh, bombs in military history. According to the military, the new weapon will replace several smaller types of nuclear bombs in its arsenal, helping to maintain the country's security and to confront international terrorism in any setting and in any region.